Hello, we're back. How are you guys doing? Uh, was, is there an echo? Did you hear that? Or is that just from uh, from Pelham's cans? It's from his cans. It's, it's, the, they say it's, it in the biz. It, the the echo is actually a sign that you're in an illusion. <laughs> yeah, right. It's a glitch <laughs> in the matrix. <laughs> yes. That's what's happening. Yep. Uh, so before we get into our next topic, I did want to cover uh, a, a few things that you guys asked in the chat. But now I can't scroll up as much as I thought I would. So if you had a specific question about illusions, uh, please put question in all caps in the beginning. We'll, we'll take about five or ten minutes to go through some of those if you guys had ones that you didn't think were covered uh, uh, in the segment itself. Um, what, what, one of which, was, of course, is the clarification that as, as I was talking, I was merging in my mind the names of minor illusion and silent image and turn them into minor <laughs> image. <laughs> it happens. There's a lot of spells and a yes. lot of things. I'm so, yeah, so every time I was saying minor image, I was referring to minor illusion, uh, the cantrip. Yeah. Uh, and we're going to record a little uh, disclaimer that we can put in the beginning of the of, of our uh, Sage Advice segment when it goes to podcast form. Do you want to do that or should I? Uh, you can do it. Okay. Because uh, <laughs> it... I, I correct people so often, I, it's good for me to get corrected. Sweet. All right. Well, I will just, <laughs> I, I'm not sure that, I guess it'll be, you can kind of splice it in after we do like the introduction to the illusions, if that makes sense. Just, uh, just uh, welcome everybody to the segment and then say, hey, just want to make this disclaimer and then toss to the formal segment. Okay. That makes sense. That'd probably be the easiest. Okay. Let's do that. Uh, Welcome, everyone, to another segment of Sage Advice. Uh, before we get into the actual recording of this, I want to uh, add this little bit that says when Jeremy uh, Crawford, who is uh, an amazing person, has a lot of things in his head, uh, is saying the word uh, minor image, he's actually saying uh, minor illusion when he's referring to... I'm, I'm messing this up. <laughs> That's what I'm saying. That was right, though, right? Yes. When you're saying minor image... I mean minor illusion. Minor illusion. Yes. All right. Well, that's good. Uh, so for the rest of the segment, uh, when you hear minor image... Image, think minor illusion, and I think we should be good to go. Okay, back to the real segment. That's actually, I actually like that better yes. because it was like way more natural with us talking about <laughs> it and laughing about it than ever. Yes. Uh, we're doing it live. Uh, so, you guys had questions. Uh, oh, yes. Uh, Corkle asks uh, a question with True Sight chooses to pass through an illusory wall created by Mirage Arcane. How does another character without True Sight? perceive this interaction how do they perceive it well let's look at the spell all right this is one of the crazy ones where you can even touch it oh i see yes so uh as the spell says creatures with true sight can see through the illusion to the terrain's true form. However, all other elements of the illusion remain. That includes its physicality. So while the creature is aware of the illusion's presence, the creature can still physically interact with the illusion. That means mm. you can't walk through it. Okay, so the character walks through the illusory wall, but you're saying that that actually they can't, can't happen. Not with this spell. Because the, what this what the spell specifically says is that the character with true sight can tell that thing is fake, uh, but then you try to walk through the fake and boom, you were gonna because again this is this is a seventh level illusion mm -hmm. with these tactile elements. You know you can touch it. Um, uh, it you can even you can even pick things up uh, from this. You know right. it talks about that you can like pick up a rock and actually feel it. Uh, in your hands, uh, but if you remove it from the spell's area, poof, the rock vanishes. I see. This, so this this is essentially the holodeck spell. Got it. Uh, so uh, that person with true sight again, even though they know. And which spell is that again? This is this is Mirage Arcane. I got it. Okay. Uh, that they they know it's fake, yet they're still going to bang right into that fake <laughs> because wall. it's a real real thing, right? And yeah. having true sight doesn't make it not real, right? They, they might, they might they they'll can notice see, illusion. They can see that it's fake. Right. Uh, but it still has the same tactile tactile thing that any other object would. Exactly. Got it. And, even, right. and not just tactile. The, uh, this, this, this spell has details in it, the kind of details I uh, either put in myself or preserve when other designers do. Wonderful things like including olfactory elements. That means you can make it stink. Mm. <laughs> or smell delicious. Delicious yes. and wonderful. Yes. Yeah. That's how I would use that spell. Yes. For the play, because again, this 
for your adventure about the acting troupe that uses illusions. Yes. And the... Uh, that's going to be, yes. be... It will be called Mirage Arcane, I think. That's Perfect. the title of the adventure right there. That, that sounds... Well, and that, and that could be the name of uh, the acting troupe. Yeah. Oh, right. Yeah. It's not Cirque du Soleil. It's uh, Mirage, Mirage Arcane. Arcane. Yep. Yes. We're going to be uh, in uh, Las Vegas for the next six months. Um uh, all right, so this one is interesting. Uh, why are basically it boils down to why are some uh, illusion based spells have a wisdom saving throw and some have an intelligence saving throw? So that often comes down to uh, the sort of experience we're expecting the target to have with the illusion. Sometimes we expect that the person is going to figure out that it's an illusion based on uh, deduction. And so if, if we're expecting you to notice things that are awry and deduce that it's fake, mm -hmm. we will typically make it uh, an intelligence saving throw. Whereas if it's really just about general perception, and just noticing things, uh, we or if it's about f uh, your will, uh, because also some illusions don't put anything out in the world, but actually attack your mind. Those are typically going to be uh, wisdom saving throws. Got it. Okay, that makes sense to me. Um, another one. Uh, so you mentioned getting damage from illusions. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, how would that? Uh, how would you describe that as a dungeon master? Is that a, getting a bloody nose? Is it brain damage? Is it? Emotional trauma. It, it it depends on it depends on the illusion, uh, and if an illusion allows you to deal, uh, you know, physical damage types, well, then the person would experience it as such. You know, if they if it's an illusion spell or other illusory effect that, let's say, allows you to even deal fire damage, well, the person would experience that as burning, like, a, like an actual burn mm -hmm. on their mm -hmm. skin. Now, typically, it would just be psychic damage, uh, and and there the the description I give to my players would be based on how the illusion was described and based on that that character's experience of that illusion. Right. But typically the, the damage type uh, for an illusion or other illusory effect would be, would be psychic damage. Makes sense. All right. I think that makes sense. Uh, and then real quick, do you want to talk one about the one about high-level high level fighters? <laughs> Well, what, what was the question? Uh, it is, uh, if you err on the side of rewarding smart use of spells, how do you keep your fighters in high levels happy? So and that's from Og Hara. So I lean on the side of rewarding clever play of all types. Uh, I don't discriminate. Uh, so uh, I have players who come up with clever things. Like in my current group, uh, the rogue player, who happens to be Chris Perkins, uh, often comes up with wonderfully creative things for his rogue to do. Uh, and I, re I err on the side of allowing him to do all sorts of things that the rules probably don't really allow, but it doesn't matter because I'm the DM. Uh, <laughs> and uh, similarly in our group, we had a fighter, now dead sadly, uh, who also was a very uh, engaged uh, creative player Happens to be my husband. Um, <laughs> first death in the campaign. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> Come play this game with me, honey. Oh, sorry. But, but also, very creative player. Uh, very descriptive on how uh, his battle master used their various maneuvers. And it was very generous in uh, the awesome stunts that that character was able to pull off. Right. Uh, so for me, it's all about, as a DM, rewarding creative play of all types uh, and keeping everyone entertained because uh, I always like to, to assemble groups of players who are not only excited about creating a fun experience together, but who also delight in the successes of one another's characters mm. uh, so that because it, this is a co-op game. Uh, and whenever I get questions like that, I always like to remind people, this is a co-op game. So when I know when I'm playing D and D, I think it's awesome when the other person's player does something awesome. Uh, and because usually it means our group is going to be more successful. Uh, and I'm glad to see the DM to reward my fellow players, uh, play. Uh, right. and again, I try to do the same when I'm the dungeon master. Uh, so I think, you know, just, I, I would say let's, let's, applaud our, our fellow 
players' successes uh, rather than resenting them. Uh, right, and, right. And DMs of, I again encourage all DMs uh, to reward clever play of all types because clever play is going to come in many different forms. It's going to come uh, in combat, it's going to come in social uh, interactions, it's going to come in exploration. And different types of players also are clever in different ways. So you might have a spellcaster player who comes up with all sorts of, you know, wonderfully wacky ways to use their, their spells. And, and so the DM could end up rewarding that clever use. You might have somebody else who is not particularly tactical in how they interact with the game and with its rules, but who might, say, be a wonderful role player. And their cleverness might come in the form of always saying exactly the right thing in a role-playing encounter mm. and, and have actually nothing to do with what's on their character sheet. Like, right. You know, just the, those people who inhabit the personality of their character, uh, you know, what they say, it's almost like it was pre-written, you know, in a script. Uh, and so that's a different kind of cleverness. And often DMs will reward that by then engaging in some wonderful role play with that person. Yeah. Someone else might be crazy clever and always figuring out where uh, you know, something is hidden in a particular room or always figures the puzzle out. Uh, so there are many different ways that cleverness can manifest at the table. And, and again, I like, I would like to reward it all uh, so that everyone feels like you know, they're contributing uh, and, and again, trying to facilitate the amusement of everybody at the table. Right. And it doesn't necessarily, because I think a lot of people make the, you know, have this question because they, they see the time uh, of the, the wizards that are, you know, oh, I have the perfect spell that I'm going to use and let me take 10 minutes looking over my spell thing, stopping all play. And then, be, oh, uh, that, that becomes what we're talking about when we're rewarding clever play. That's not necessarily what we're talking about here. No. That, that's a pro- problematic yeah. situation yeah. that is not inherent to wizards and high-level magic and, and what, what the spell was in there. But I, I have seen and experienced some of that as well. And so I, I don't I, – what you're talking about is making sure that it is actual clever play and not uh, something that would uh, uh, take away from someone else's fun. Exactly. Uh, yeah, clever play shouldn't be confused with hugging, hugging uh, the time at the table. Yeah. Uh, because as, as I've said on this channel before, one of the things I will often tell a new group of players, particularly if I'm DMing at a convention, is if they're playing a spellcaster, please have their player's handbook open to the spell they're going to cast by the time their, their turn starts. Uh, yeah. Because I actually, I don't have a whole lot of patience for people when it's suddenly their turn causing everyone else to wait while they suddenly figure out how their character works. Yeah. Uh, now, if they're a new player, I am happy as DM to walk them through uh, what's going on, uh, but I consider sort of being a courteous player, being prepped basically for when your play, when your turn is going to come around. Because I know often if like if I'm playing a spellcaster before my turn comes around, I'm like flipping frantically through the book. Okay, am I going to cast this or am I going to cast that? And okay, is it clear in my head how this is going to work? And so I, so I, that I'm prepped. <laughs> and I like the urgency of it, too. Like, yeah. oh, I, maybe, I, you know, it's, it's mm-hmm. similar. I mean, it's nothing like this at all. But I, I equate it to being at a restaurant and not making a decision of what you're going to order until the waiter asks you, what do you want? And you're like, ah, that. You know, and I, <laughs> I, I, I sometimes play spellcasters that way where right. I'm like, oh, I don't really know what I want, but you're asking me and I'm going to say this. And I'm going to go with it because yep. it, it was a good enough idea to come mm-hmm. out of my mouth and let's just see it forward. Yeah. Right. But, yeah. The, you know, but the idea that there's one perfect move mm-hmm. that you can make. Uh, we'll just bog down and, and make things not less, less fun. I would also advise, you know, because sometimes, you know, I'll get, I'll, I'll get quite, you know, people will ponder, you know, well, you know, or just, you know, spells always going to be flashier and fancier than what, say, a fighter can do. And I would say, well, if, if as a player, you're really kind of looking longingly at all that flashiness that a spellcaster has, well, play a spellcaster. Right. You um, can do it, too. Yeah, you can, too. You can even multi-class from your fighter into a spellcaster yeah. and do it, too. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I say that because sometimes then there is a drive for us. Well, can't we make everything that the, like the fighter does as flashy as a spell? Well, if we did that, we would actually be going against what we know based on our survey data many of our fighter players want and that is they don't want to play the the you know the person sh- shooting lightning out of their fingers and and all that you know that's what the person who's playing the wizard or some other spellcaster right. is doing right uh, many times the the character fantasy that a person wants when they go to a class like the fighter is 
they're playing the person who is not wielding these supernatural forces unless they decide to like go into Eldritch Knight, uh, which is there as kind of a we put in as a you know a bridge yeah. uh, between these different character archetypes. Uh, so we have to make sure we preserve the different archetypes and not turn everybody into basically everyone everyone is a wizard but we just you know call it a different thing yeah uh, you know right. it's uh, one of the things we learned in the playtest process and this will lead into our our, our next segment on nice. playtesting uh is that people like the classes to do different things and mm. and they like uh for us to preserve their story archetypes uh fighter should feel different in the world and i'm not just talking about game mechanics it should feel different in the story uh, they should have a different role in the world, uh, which makes sense. I yeah. mean, just if we just think about it, you know, captain of the guard, if let's say that that is the fighter, is going to have a very different role in the world than woman who spends her time in a tower with a book full of spells and is summoning creatures from other worlds. I mean, that's just those are two very different stories and can both be compelling stories. Right. Because think yeah. think about all I could easily build an entire adventure just about some crazy plot going on in the city watch and have it about, you know, that fighter and that fighter's story. Uh, Cause I've done that for, for the people in my campaigns who play fighters and rogues and, and other non spellcasters. Uh, there's so many great stories you can tell about these people uh, who are not suffused with magic. Yeah. Uh, but well, and in some ways that's what Dungeons and Dragons is too, is, is, is the combination of those stories that like, you can have that story that is the fighters, you know, uh, uh, captain of the guard story with the sorceresses, with the, mm -hmm. the priestesses and all these things mm -hmm. put together. And it's that combination of very different archetypes that is at the heart of what made Dungeons and Dragons fun for people. Absolutely. I think, right. So yeah. you can't just, right. You can't just paint everybody with the same brush or every each class mm -hmm. with the same brush, uh, because it is part of the mysticism of what makes that hobby fun. Uh, yeah. will will get lost. Absolutely. Yeah. And we have also all these choices because, again, when you, if you feel yourself looking at what the other person can do and you're like, oh, that seems really cool. Well, the next time you make a character, do it. Yeah. Try it out. That's what you can do um, with a framework like this. Yeah. I mean, yeah. that's, that's, you know, I, I think I've mentioned before here that, you know, sometimes, uh, you know, even though I normally play spellcasters, sometimes I'll look at, oh, it just looks so nice to be so resilient and just go in there and right. have all the hit points in the world. And then yeah. like, oh, next time I'm making a barbarian or yeah. you know, next time I'm making a fighter. Uh, I hear that. I hear that. Uh, yeah. So uh, there's two uh, persistent questions in here, which we're getting running. Do you have anything at four that you need to do? Uh I have a book to work on. Well, there's that. <laughs> <laughs> We're going to forego all that and just talk to you, the audience. Uh, no more books. I'm no just more talking books. on Twitch. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> That's my job. You can't take that. Uh, so uh, what's your uh, – uh, oh, man, I'm losing it now. Uh, the ca the person in the chat who is asking about uh, the Warcaster. Let's just get that out of the way. Uh, I believe you said you answered this on Twitter already. Oh, but yeah, repeat the question to me just to make sure. That's what I'm trying to find. It's the question I'm thinking of. Yes. And while you do that, I will flip. Sleeper Cave, you're the person. Can, can you just repeat your question in a succinct way so I can repeat it to uh, to hear uh, Mr. Jeremy and, and get it all figured out? Um, yeah, because I don't have the questions. I know. I don't need them, Adam, either. Uh, <clears throat> the, uh, in the meantime, though, Shadow Conjuration, Evocation, and similar spells aren't in 5th edition. Um uh, was there was there a reason behind that? So uh, some of that shadowy uh, illusion magic, uh, you can see an example of it in Xanathar's Guide. Ah. Where you can create, out of shadow stuff, create an illusory dragon. Uh, so I, I, I enjoy that, you know, kind of making semi-real stuff uh, angle to illusion. So, yeah, we, we brought some of that shadow-themed illusion magic back in Xanathar's Guide. And that's where the, the Mirage <clears throat> Arcane, is that the stuff that is being made? Is it shadow stuff? Uh, I, let's see, I don't think we specified in that spell that it's shadow stuff that you're using, uh, but that there was definitely a trope in previous editions mm -hmm. uh, that I was glad to bring back. Uh, yeah, we don't specify it there. Nice. All right. Well, I feel like Sleeper <laughs> Cave might have might have left, uh, but he was asking uh, a attack of opportunity for the war the war mage or the war caster. Uh, Pelham, do you have that question? Uh, 
Uh, oh, we know here it is. Yep, he just did it. Uh, thank you for for sticking with us and answering this again. It has been said a uh, warcaster has been said to be attack of opportunity in sage, but the wording in PHB sounds otherwise. Is it an AO? Is it an attack of opportunity or not? And does it get modified by other things that modify attacks of opportunity? Uh, so I, I guess we're missing here, but as this part of this question is, Warcaster has been said to be attack of opportunity. What does that mean? So, so Warcaster, Warcaster lets you when a hostile creature provokes an attack of, uh, if their movement provokes an attack of opportunity from you. Mm -hmm. If you have this feat, you can use a reaction to cast a spell at the creature, and as stated in the feat, rather than making an opportunity attack. So you're casting a spell instead of making an opportunity attack. Okay, and so th his question is, <coughs> do things that modify attack of opportunities happen when that happens, and you're saying that no, it no, does not? No, no, because yeah, you're, you're casting a spell instead of making an opportunity attack. Okay, cool. You're just doing it at the time when you normally would make an opportunity attack. Exactly. You're swapping but, it out. But it doesn't have both, it's just one, it's, you're only doing the, the cast a spell action, not the attack of opportunity action. Yeah. Or you're right, okay. You're, okay, that, I think that makes sense to me. Hopefully that makes sense to you, uh, Mr. Sleeper Cave, uh, Mr. or Mrs. <laughs> Sleeper Cave. Uh, thank you for that. Uh, all right, cool, well I think with those out of the way, we have 25 minutes left before four o'clock. We uh, can do it. We can do it. We're gonna talk <clears throat> about play testing mm -hmm. and all that stuff. So are we already recording? We, we are now. Uh, <laughs> let me make sure you're good. All right, good. Welcome to another segment of Sage Advice. Uh, I am Greg Tito, and I'm joined by Jeremy Crawford. Hello, everyone. And we are going to talk about a specific topic within the Dungeons and Dragons uh, rules, uh, and uh, and how it is made, and how those rules are made. And especially with Fifth Edition, there was a lengthy play test called D and D Next, uh, in which 175,000 of uh, D and D fans out there downloaded versions of the game and offered feedback and. That ended up with fifth edition, but that that uh, idea of play testing and getting player feedback has continued uh, through the life cycle of fifth edition, and we want to kind of talk about that and and uh, uh, Jeremy's work on the uh, on Arthur Canna series on uh, uh, and how some of those things ended up in printed material and what the differences between all that. So it's a big topic, uh, and it is all about how we're we're taking feedback from you, the fans. So uh, yeah, where where should we start? Well. You and I really wanted to dive into this partly because of Xanathar's Guide uh, to Everything coming out. And Correct. it uh, exists thanks to a lot of feedback uh, from our community. Lots of playtesting feedback, not only through the Unearthed Arcana series, uh, but then also playtest feedback from our playtesters who've signed NDAs. Because for anyone who doesn't know, um, often our books, pieces of them, we will preview publicly, usually through Unearthed Arcana, and get feedback that way. While at the same time, we send portions of the book to sort of our, we call them sometimes our alpha playtesters. They get to see more, give us feedback, and we get all of that feedback in private. And then the combination of those two sets of feedback, in addition to our own game development and internal playtesting, results in the final version mm. of a particular rule. So <clears throat> Xanathar's Guide, uh, like all of our books, uh, has had a uh, playtest review, but it, like the core books, uh, was particularly the result of a lot of public feedback because uh, every one of the subclasses in Xanathar's Guide uh, was released in some form or another in the Unearth Unearthed Arcana series uh, many, many months, uh, and in a few cases, uh, more than a year uh, before the book came out. Mm -hmm. And also in some cases, people got to see more than one version of a particular subclass. Right. And so what that is, is that was an example of us looking at playtest feedback, uh, seeing what was working and what wasn't, uh, doing some revisions, and then sending out a new version, getting feedback on it, then doing more revisions until, again, people saw the final version that's in Xanathar's And guide. those were just the public ones. There were also many internal rounds within that. Yes. Uh, so even though you may have seen two versions of a class, there might have been four or five different versions that were up for, for playtest. A absolutely. There was a whole version of the Kensei, for instance, for the monk uh, that I wrote one night 
uh, that we never that we never sent out after drinking a whole lot of water. <laughs> <laughs> that was water. That's right. <laughs> um, and but so the question that I often get asked uh, is, well, what determines what makes it into a book? Be- yeah. Because of the Unearth Arcana process, people saw things uh, in those uh, articles that are not in Xanathar's Guide. So people naturally want to know, well, where did it go? Right. Why? Uh, uh, because, you know, there were subclasses. There were also feats. Uh, there were also some spells people saw. There were optional rules people saw, like mass combat. Uh, there were a number of things that we showed off over the past year that are not in this book. So I have several answers for what happened. Uh, so a few things were received well and might show up later. So that immediately oh, okay. that immediately draws out the question, what does it mean to be received well? And so what we're usually aiming for is 70% satisfaction. We want uh, for something we publish in the game to be satisfactory to at least 70% uh, of our players, which is actually a pretty high bar. Uh, and we're happiest when we can push the satisfaction level up to 80, 85%. Right. Sometimes we'll see something up in the 90s, like the Forge domain, uh, the new domain for the cleric uh, was uh, edging up around the 90s. It was so well liked uh, for Xenathar's good. Guide. Uh, um, that's important to to, to uh, maybe we overstate if we haven't stated already is that uh, through the playtest process, many versions of the game have been playtested before. But I think the first time in fifth edition, it was codified into surveys and got we were able to get those 85, 70 percent numbers with a large enough sample size to actually be able to extrapolate. OK, we think, you know, 70 percent of our fan base, total fan base it can will enjoy this this feature or class or things like that, right? Absolutely. And it's funny. It's connected to something. Uh, I, I even uttered these words to Mike Merles today at lunch, uh, where we, he, he and I are always talking about things we're working on now and things we're going to work on, you know, way down the road. And uh, in, in that conversation, I just offhand brought up, you know, we're in the happiness business, where it is, it is our job to make as many of our fellow D&D fans as happy as possible and that's why uh, we have become really strict about chasing those things that are going to make as many people happy as possible. Now, it still means not everyone's going to be happy right. uh, because even with a, a, a target of 70% or higher satisfaction, that's still potentially 30% of the people who aren't going to like something. And that's fine because of how many different options we have. I mean, this is why we have all the different classes we have with different subclass options, many different spell options, uh, etc. We have all these options always with the hope of appealing to as, as broad of an audience as we can because something we've talked about many times going all the way back to the D&D Next Playtest is we have seen over and over again that the D&D audience is amazingly diverse, not only in terms of type of people who play our game, but also in terms of everyone's tastes. Uh, you know, people like, you know, everyone has a different kind of character they want to play, a different kind of campaign they want to play in, a different play style they prefer. We need to make sure that D&D is a big kind of high fantasy storytelling platform has a place for these different modes um, mm. while keeping the whole game simple. <laughs> it's, right. a, it's a balancing act that, that we, you know, because we don't want to achieve that by, you know, overloading the, the game with rules. Uh, so, you know, we like to keep things as open-ended as possible, et cetera. So, we, so the things in Xanathar's are the things that over the course of playtesting scored the highest in terms of satisfaction. There are a few minor exceptions. There were a couple of things that were well liked, but we ended up delaying them. Uh, and usually it's because we wanted to do more work on them. Like mm. we said, okay, this is worth doing more with, but not now. Uh, we have enough, like basically we have enough to fill the roster. The book is, is good. Uh, we can save this for another time and we can get it just right. Mm. Um, or was that based on like personal satisfaction satisfaction from 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 the designers that we were like, well, yeah, it's almost there. Yeah, because we, we, wanna... we also, you know, once we look at the playtest feedback and we make sure we're addressing people's concerns, uh, 
we also have to just decide, you know, are we nailing it to our own satisfaction? You know, are we, do we feel we're really succeeding at addressing people's uh, desires and concerns about a particular option? And if we don't feel we're there yet, and if there's no pressure for us to solve it now, mm. we will push it uh, to another product. Uh, now, if we needed to fill, like, oh, God, um, we need we need to put more stuff in this book. Um, <laughs> That's and, what we need to commission more art and just put the art in. <laughs> we, which, by the way, is, is almost never a problem we have because almost always we design way more than we need. That's true. Um, the te- I think you've said in, on previous parts of the, co- the, the podcast that you, you will cut text more so than cutting uh, uh, graphical elements. Yes. Yeah, because we – because we always know we're going to end up designing things that just don't hit their targets. And so we always design more than we need and then zero in on the things that people like most. Mm. Because, again, we're in the happiness business. So let's let's make sure we're making the those happy-making things appeal to as many people as possible. Right. So here's an example of something in the playtest process. And, again, there weren't very many of these. But there were a few that scored really high. Um but it just wasn't their time yet. And so one of those was the stone sorcerer. A lot of people liked it. We really liked it. Uh, but there was some more we wanted to do, uh, not just with the stone sorcerer, but also with the phoenix sorcerer and the sort of some elemental things going on there and wanting uh, you know, to sort of approach them in a more holistic way. We were already full up on the sorcerer being super well liked. because that. So it's basically with the sorcerer, we had a high class problem. Mm. Uh, we had more satisfaction for the subclasses than we expected. So we had basically more subclasses <laughs> available than we had a room we were planning in and also time on uh, devoting to the sorcerer because that's something that's often invisible to people who uh, buy our books and play our game is every rule is for us has a cost of time mm-hmm. uh, because getting it right, testing it, reading the feedback, uh, those are hours, if not days, if in some cases, if not weeks, if not months of work. And so we always are having to do the calculus of essentially, do we have the time, this resource, do we have enough of it to do this thing right? right. And if we don't right now, we're going to, we'll, we'll save it because uh, uh, it turns out there will be more D&D books and some of these things can come later. And it's much better to nail it and get it in a way that's personally satisfying as well as uh, uh, res- resonating with the fans through the surveys and things like that. So you can be like, all right, well, that's, let's not rush this out the door. Let's make sure that this is exactly what we, we, we think we want to publish. Absolutely. And, and also in the book we want it to be in because mm-hmm. sometimes things will sync up nicely with other things we're working on. Oh, right, like story-wise, which, yeah. Exactly. And so sometimes also there's, there's things we can't talk about yet because, you know, we're often planning, you know, many books ahead and we might realize wait this thing we're working on would actually be better in like a book four books from now mm-hmm. um, I'm incredibly nervous you're going to say the, <laughs> the names of those books <laughs> I know <laughs> and now I'm suddenly going to announce yeah. <laughs> our next four books Bob's <laughs> Baba Bob <laughs> so uh, again very few things from this past uh, year and a half or so of Unearthed Arcana are in that category of super well liked but we're delaying it. Right. Uh, pretty much everything else that got uh, cut uh, as a as a potential uh, occupant in Xanathar's Guide to Everything was cut simply because the satisfaction scores weren't high enough. Mm. Uh, just there weren't enough people who wanted those things in the game, and so we just couldn't justify moving forward with them. Uh, when other things that people were more excited about. Uh, were in front of us and we had enough. I mean, we, again, we ended up with this wonderful buffet of things that people were happy about. Um, and now someone might wonder, well, if we're, if we're just guided by satisfaction, could we end up with a book where like we planned on having something for every class, but instead we have, it's all just for the rogue because <laughs> people only, like, only the like rogue playing stuff. rogues. Yeah. So there are of course other factors that we have to balance this with. We have to balance satisfaction also with completeness, you know, because one of one of our goals for Xanathar's uh, going into it was every class needs to have at least one subclass. Right. Uh, I think and you got up to two for each subclass, right? Everyone but the wizard. And right. the reason for that is actually the wizard subclasses did not score particularly well until we did the war mage. Uh, and even it was like just squeaked over the line. 68%. But because 
uh, we needed to have something for the wizard that was a case of, okay, we'll devote time to get this right. Uh, and whereas if we'd already been full up on wizards, we're like, okay, go, go, buddy, you can wait. Right. Um, we got we got more well liked versions of you that we want people yeah, to see. Yeah. And uh, on some of those, so <clears throat> oh yeah, sorry, go ahead. And and so, but that the wizard is a great example of we are not going to publish something just to fill pages. Yeah. Uh, that because the other wizard subclasses uh, were not achieving the satisfaction that we wanted uh, to see. And we felt they would require an amount of work that could end up not even paying off in much of a satisfaction increase. We just moved on uh, and said, okay, wizard, you get one. That makes um, sense. But we also knew that was an easy decision to make because we knew the wizard was also getting more spells in this book than anybody else. So right. in many ways, if you're playing a wizard, the thing you want most are spells. Uh, so yeah, it's less about the, <clears throat> the specific subclass of a wizard you're playing, right? Right, and and so we, that was a higher priority for us to make sure we delivered the the spells for the wizard. What about things like the uh, the, the the way you were guys reconceptualizing the ranger, for example? Oh yeah, so we have other things that we've play tested uh, over the last couple years uh, that are not here, but we announced uh, in advance that they wouldn't be here. Uh, so there's the revised ranger, uh, there's the mystic class, and there's the artificer. <clears throat> so those three things we announced before Xanathar's Guide came out, not going to be in it. Yeah. But we are still working on them. So they, their fate uh, was not sunk by low satisfaction or anything like that because the artificer and the mystic both had high satisfaction. But introducing a new class to the game is way more labor-intensive if we're going to get it right, uh, mm -hmm. then introducing a subclass for an already existing class. And the Mystic in particular introduces a whole new magic system uh, that right now in its current form is 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 frankly kind of uh, bonkazonks broken. Uh, so <laughs> <laughs> the technical term, <coughs> it, yes. it got bonkazonks. Yeah. And so before, basically, and I mean, this is really what it came down to, before I would allow the, art, uh, the Mystic into the game, uh, it needs a lot more playtesting and a lot more development. Um, we also have some new angles we want to try with it. Mm. Uh, and and then there's the question of just when is the right time uh, to introduce uh, either of these new classes, which oh. are, which are they're niche archetypes. Uh, they're, they have their fans. People want them. We want them. Uh, but they're in a different category from, say, fighter, rogue, cleric, wizard, and, and the other real classic archetypes. So sure. you know, we want them to have a home, but uh, it just it's not ready quite yet. Uh, now, as for the revised ranger, uh, it is in a different category because it's something we haven't done otherwise, which is put out a almost kind of a redo on a core class. It the revised ranger definitely has its fans, but the longer that the the unearthed arcana process went, uh, leading up to the release of Xanathar's Guide to Everything, the more I noticed that actually the revised ranger was causing confusion. Uh, that mm. having a second version of a class in the player's handbook, for the people who were aware of it, uh, we're always wondering: Wait, is does this thing work with the revised ranger or the player's handbook ranger? And and it's the 3.5 3. point problem where it's like, yes. oh, what does that mean? Yeah. And and then there is also the issue uh, that might surprise uh, many of our listeners, uh, particularly those who are fond of the revised ranger, uh, that most of our fans have no idea exists. Uh, and <laughs> and actually, many of our players love the player's handbook ranger. So the conundrum is we don't want to release a version of the ranger that takes away the ranger that actually many people are enjoying. Uh, and even if you look at D&D Beyond play statistics, a lot of people play uh, the player's handbook ranger. Uh, yeah. And so... It's almost like at a point where you'd want to create a whole... Rather than calling it a revised ranger, call it like, you know, it's a, a completely new thing so that it doesn't feel like it's conflicting with both. But it, but then it, you would want to do that for a story reason almost it, rather than it being. Exactly. Because yeah. our, our class design is driven by story first and foremost. Uh, that archetype already exists. You know, we're not going to create 
uh, a second ranger class and and call it you know something else the rangier or what you know what <laughs> <I laughs> whatever I was trying to come up with a witty <laughs> right. thing but yeah, yeah. Or, I, I would or, have just said Bob's Bob Bob thing again <laughs> right <laughs> or the seeker from fourth edition which was basically a a, a different take on the the ranger yeah um, we're on, we're not going to do that because in fifth our our classes are archetype based and our archetypes are narrative categories. Uh, and we're not going to create a class that's just simply there uh, because people want a different set of, me- of game mechanics. The other thing that we found, the more we looked carefully at uh, the revised Ranger feedback, is something I suspected going into that whole thing, is really dissatisfaction with the player's handbook Ranger is mostly about the Beastmaster. Mm. And my philosophy when it comes to kind of stewardship of the game is if something is broken, just fix the broken thing and move on. Because it gets really dangerous if you start messing around with things around the broken thing. uh, Because then you can start destabilizing uh, the game. Uh, You can, again, you can start taking things away from people, you know, and they like those things. uh, Because that... That's the other thing. For, it, it can just not just for D and D players, but just for us as humans, we often forget that the thing we don't like, someone else loves. Right. And and the thing we love, you're always going to meet somebody who has no interest in it or who thinks it's the worst. And it's important. The thing that you mentioned, I want to make sure we highlight here, is that there are a audience of folks who follow Unearthed Arcana. Uh, the the you know, sometimes monthly, sometimes bi-monthly, sometimes weekly series of uh, uh, of these articles that you and uh, Mike produce. Uh, but that's not the entire D and D audience. The no. entire D and D audience uh, is much larger. And so, it, while it may feel like Unearthed Arcana's uh, releases are a big part of uh, your D and D fandom, it's not. It's not true for everyone else. So, if we start to fragmentize that it, it can lead to more problems to the fact that you're saying like oh we're, you just took that away because of a revised ranger that came out that was based on on Arcana feedback but which which is actually f- you know not not uh fully representative of everybody which is one of the reasons why we get feedback from multiple channels right um so we're still looking at how to proceed uh it's most likely with the ranger going to be a much more targeted revision uh, and will be optional. Like basically here's a swap out. Like you can take this Beastmaster thing and use this other thing in its place. Which makes sense. I mean, I mean, you can make a new subclass and it just kind of creates some of that, uh, uh, you know, re- remove some of that uh, confusion that people might have. And, and going, going, at it, going at it at that angle, I've been exploring the possibility of us developing uh, a few swap outs for several classes in the player's handbook mm-hmm. of, you know, because we know there are certain features that people are not crazy about, not just in the Beastmaster, but we know this like in the way of the four elements in the monk, uh, there's some dissatisfaction uh, and uh, there's some dissatisfaction in a few features in the sorcerer. We could look at uh, presenting alternative versions of just those features mm-hmm. and let you just cleanly swap them out with no other effect on the class. Uh, and no ripple effect uh, elsewhere. That makes sense. Uh, like if that. we do anything like that, though, it, of course, will go through the feedback process. We'll show it in an Arcana. Nothing would become official without people giving us feedback. Because if people saw it and they're like, we hate it, well, then we won't proceed with it. So no one listening to this has to worry that we're suddenly going to spring these options on you and right. put them It'll in the be game. As public as we can be oh, uh, yeah. uh, as yeah. far as that goes. Yeah, uh, and that's... And that's this is all why we're taking our time, because I know there are some people who really are jazzed about some of the changes in the revised Ranger. Like, why don't we have it yet? Why don't we have it yet? And it's we have to proceed cautiously, because, uh, again, the last thing I ever want us to do is take something away from people uh, who are already enjoying it. Yeah. Uh, and I also don't want to sow confusion. Um, one of the big things that's important to us is that people are, always know where the ground is beneath them when they come to play D&D. They know they can get their player's handbook. And that's the, that's the the baseline of the game, and they you know they have what they need and they can mm-hmm. play. I don't want a bunch of hoops that people have to go through, uh, or or other bits of confusion about what you know. W- will the real Bob please uh, stand up? 
That's uh, why we're going to, when we do release, you know, these revised Ranger rules, we're going to immediately destroy magically every player's handbook in the world and have it <laughs> automatically be replaced with a new version that has errata in it, <laughs> right. as well as uh, right. these all these revised features. So uh, no if, confusion will happen. <laughs> if only, yeah. <laughs> uh, it was going to be coming from from Unearthed Arcana and and kind of the playtesting of things going in, in 2018 as we as we start looking forward here. Uh, so we have uh, more options coming up. Uh, you know, recently people have seen some new elf uh, sub races. We did some new fiendish options. Uh, we'll continue to explore uh, different corners of the D&D multiverse uh, with both uh, player-focused uh, options and DM-focused options. Uh, it will all continue to be unofficial in Unearth Arcana until we decide to make it official in a book uh, like Xanathar's Guide to Everything or you know, in an adventure or in a book like Volo's Guide. Um, all, you know, most of our books, again, have elements in them that at some point blipped into the public in, in some form or another. And, and that will continue uh, in, in the year ahead. Um, it, it is funny, uh, one little clue people can look for. I, well, yeah, again, yeah. I, I always like to, again, behind the curtain stuff. <laughs> one clue people can look for in an Earth Arcana that we're particularly interested in the sort of future potential official status of something is if they see my name on the article. Oh. Uh, because normally I only step in and work on an unearthed arcana if we think it has potential down the road. Typically, if I'm not involved, we're more just kind of experimenting and just saying, eh, this was something fun we were thinking about. Um, no, it, that, Mike's initiative rules come to mind. Oh, yes, yes. <laughs> <laughs> As yeah, like, those those initiative rules, again, we put them out and like these are never going in the game. It's but just a fun little yeah. exercise and different way to think about initiative. Yeah, 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 exactly. Because we, those articles are also valuable to us because sometimes when we just sort of shake the tree, like here's this crazy idea we were thinking about. Yeah. Um, something, sometimes something will fall out of the tree we didn't expect. Mm. And then that thing that we thought was just sort of experiment playtime could inspire us to create something uh, for real that people are going to love in the game. So that's why, uh, to me, every Unearthed Arcana that we do is worthwhile, uh, even when my name isn't on it, which, again, is the clue that we're kind of, we're starting to go down the road of, oh, we think this we might been, actually do something with this. It's got the manage, managing editor's touch <laughs> on it. So yes. It, it might mean, it mean something. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, it, even the one, uh, the other ones are valuable because sometimes they will spark a reaction in the community that will cause us to say, hey, there's something yeah. here. And we hadn't considered how fun or interesting this could be. And so we're going to push it to the next level. And that's really cool, too, because it also, uh, I mean, it's great when fruit comes from from things like that. But I think that kind of short form of, uh, of designers making stuff and getting it out in front of people um, is valuable just keeping those design muscles exercised in a way, right? Yeah. It's, it's similar to, you know, uh, a, a reading, I'm, I'm going to make a theater analogy again, but like, you know, a, a, a reading from a playwright where you're just kind of reading through the play, you're not staging it fully, but you get that, it's, you know, it's much lower impact uh, as far as production goes, but you get to feel it how it goes and you might be inspired or, you know, pull on a thread of something like that, you know, either sketch comedy, things like that, smaller form. Absolutely. Yeah. Short fiction even. Yeah. And it, it also not only is a way for our designers to keep keep playing and, and experimenting with things. And when I say our designers, of course, I'm talking about myself too. <laughs> I'm kind of half talking about myself in uh, the third person. Um, uh, uh, but uh, it's also a way to satisfy a need in the audience because uh, I, I know as a D&D fan, I know many of us as D&D fans, we just like seeing new things for D&D. &D. Yeah. And, you know, we, we have our, our deliberate book publishing schedule, you know, three books a year. Uh, but people still often want to see, I want to see some new D&D &D stuff. So Unearthed Arcana is a way for us to play around with some things each month uh, without risking destabilizing the game by releasing uh, of official content constantly. Right. Uh, because getting official content to the polished state that it needs to be is a, is a lot of work. Uh, and again, that when I say that polished state, it needs to be. What I'm talking about is a state where people are still going to enjoy the game they're already enjoying. 
that adding the thing to their game isn't going to disrupt it, mm -hmm. that they're going to be happy uh, that the thing was added. Uh, We're in the happiness business. <laughs> exactly, exactly. <laughs> and that it can be added or ignored seamlessly because mm -hmm. some something I wrote in the uh, introduction of Xanathar's Guide and actually repeated several times in the book, everything in this book is optional. Everything in, in fact, all of our books other than the core books is optional. Uh, we, we only want people to use the stuff that makes them smile. Yeah. Uh, and at the end of the day, because number one rule is the DM is the adjudicator, even everything in the core books <laughs> is optional. Don't tell anyone that. Uh, right. <laughs> but but it, I mean, there's stuff in there, like the feats of the, of the player's handbook, which is completely optional. Yeah, even feats in the yeah. player's handbook. We even tell you they're in the core book. They are optional. Yeah. Multiclassing is an optional right. rule. And then by extension, not only is everything optional in Xanathar's Guide, but in particular, uh, the new feats mm. there are optional. Now, another question I sometimes get about uh, playtesting having to do with like very particular things. It's like, why why didn't X, Y, or Z make it? And I just thought of this because of talking about the feats in yeah. Xanathar's Guide. Uh, you know, people want to know, well, there was another human feat uh, in the playtest. Where did it go? Uh, there was another Dragonborn feat. How come it's not in the book? Now, some things, uh, first and foremost, they just didn't meet the satisfaction threshold. And then when we drill in, because anytime something doesn't make it, Mm -hmm. satisfaction wise I always drill in to find out why because uh, it's important for me uh, to know what resonates with people and what doesn't yeah so in in those particular cases uh, in some like the feats there were also some subclasses this was true for in Xanathar's guide uh, people don't like some things if they're too much like something that's already in the game uh, they often don't like it if there's no resonant story for them. Mm -hmm. uh, they, it basically it fails to pass the test of, I can think of someone cool in a story using this thing. That's often one of the most important tests uh, for a D&D player is imagining a character using this thing and really loving that kind of narrative that unfolds in your mind as you imagine using it. Also, people don't like it uh, when other things in the game where it feels like their turf is being encroached upon. Uh, so a great example of this is uh, the other human feat that didn't make it into the book. Satisfaction was fairly low, and when I dug into the playtest feedback with Ben Petrosor and looked at it, it, it became clear that people basically didn't like it because it felt like it was encroaching on the halfling's turf. It was starting to be a bit too much like the halfling's lucky trait. Oh, I see. Uh, and that's a funny balancing act because players tend to either feel like something's encroaching or what's funny in Xanathar's Guide we have something we have um, uh, the divine soul in the sorcerer which basically is looting the cleric spell list people liked it <laughs> but here's why story story right it's always about story yeah because in the human one it was basically, it was a game mechanic. Mm. And people didn't really have a quibble with the game mechanic, but because it was a, essentially a story-free game mechanic that we thought, hey, this would be fun, and hey, humans are scrappy, uh, let's give them this. But people rightly came back and said, well, this feels like the halfling. Yeah. And there was no, like, there's, it wasn't dripping with story. And so it was easy for it to then just feel like this is echoing something that's already in the game and it's right. not exciting me. Switch over now instead to the divine soul. This is a person infused with power from the gods, and they are channeling this godly power as a sorcerer, not as some priest, but as a person with this innate magic, a person who is themselves divine because of this power that is inside them. We say in that subclass, you get to use the cleric spell list, and people are like, awesome. Sweet. <laughs> but... In contrast, I can guarantee you, if I put if I put a feed out or uh, a a subclass feature with no story that just simply said, "Hey, you get to use the cleric spell list. Have fun, whatever other class you are." Yeah, people would say this is lazy crap. 
Um, You're just doing one for the other. It's a swap. <laughs> right. right. It's like a right. color palette, palette swap yeah. in old school video games, right? Yeah. And so, but sometimes those simple swaps are the best thing to do. So it's also not, it's actually not about uh, how complex or straightforward the thing is. Mm. So often it really is about the wonderful alchemy in D&D about marrying game mechanics to storytelling. And when we succeed at that, when the two are meeting and speaking to each other in a way that resonates for somebody, satisfaction goes up. Uh, and, it, and it's funny because often a lot of people online will you know, crunch the numbers and say, yeah, but this guy isn't dealing as much damage as this other one. And it turns out for most of our players, they don't care. Right. Uh, what they care about is, does it look like I can make uh, an awesome character in a story using this subclass and have some way to shine. Because mm. that's the other thing in our design philosophy is not everybody shines the same way. We always make sure everyone can shine, but they're not all going to shine in the same way. There are sense. people who are always going to deal more damage. Right. There are other people who are always going to be more effective in uh, exploration encounters or uh, social interaction etc. Right. There are always going to be some people who are flashier than other people. And there are other people who are always going to, their, their character is going to be more reliable than other people. And again, that's the, the fun of what Dungeons and Dragons is. So if you, you know, the, the, the divine soul, it just seemed like, oh, that's, that's, that's a facet of fantasy story time that I want to jump into. Uh, you know, I don't even really care about the mechanics. You know, like right. I, I, that makes sense. Oh, it has a cool mechanic too? Whoa. All right. Well, you're blowing my mind. Yeah. 70%. You know, yep. right? And that's, yep. and that's all you need. And that makes a lot of sense. Cool. Well, I'm excited about where we are right now in the in the the process of of, of, uh, of fifth edition, and that these unearthed arcanas are going to be continuing to coming out uh, uh, in 2018, and, and and testing some more stuff and getting them out into the public view, uh, as well as all the behind the scenes stuff that I know about that I can't tell anyone, <laughs> uh, which is really exciting too. So, uh, where can people? Well, a we mentioned unearthed arcana a bunch of times. So, in case you, uh, we'll mention it in the intro to the podcast, but where can people find out uh, about that, and what's the current schedule of where that you think that's going to be in? in 2018? Uh, so we are uh, moving forward. We aim to have Unearthed Arcana out each month on the second Monday of the month. Uh, it, you know, unless, of course, there's like we're all out of the office on a holiday right. or something. On, and on it comes out day. as a, a PDF mm -hmm. uh, on the Dungeons and Dragons website. Uh, yes. You can search under uh, articles uh, uh, as well as just Unearthed Arcana. Uh, it will come up. Uh, it's also in Dragon Plus if, mm -hmm. I, if I'm Right, I think it doesn't I think at least some of the time. Yeah, and I don't think it comes directly at the same time. So the first time will will be on on on, on uh, uh, DungeonsandDragons dot com, but then you can find it on Dragon Plus, uh, which is an app that you can download for your Android phone. Uh, your t uh, iOS ta uh, tablet or other phone, uh, or on the web at uh, DragonMag dot com. Uh, all right, and then if people want to ask you questions about everything that we covered uh, in the last thirty five minutes, I, I can be reached uh, on Twitter at Jeremy E Crawford. Awesome. Uh, and you guys can follow me. I'm at Greg Tito. Uh, ask me questions if Jeremy doesn't get back to you in time, and I'll ping him and make sure he has the answers. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I do here. Uh, we'll be doing more stage advice uh, in uh, 2018 uh, for more uh, Dragon Talk, uh, but uh, we'll be back uh, next week. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you, everyone. Ba -ba -bum. All right. Thank you, guys. Thank you, Scooter Jack, for subscribing with Twitch Prime. You're the way to go. Uh, I mentioned that Bob, Bob, Bob thing, and that was all of chat was all like trying to figure out <laughs> what I meant by that <laughs> and or uh, how Bob is D&D &D and all the above. So thank you guys for making me laugh uh, while I was trying to pay attention to Jeremy. <laughs> <laughs> that was good stuff. Uh, there is no dice. Uh, there's no... Force Gray, that's the show that would have been uh, airing after this. Uh, we're going to wrap up Dragon Talk recording now. Um, tomorrow, uh, we I believe there will be a Dragon Plus at 2 p.m. Other otherwise, we'll do a vodcast. Uh, but I'll be back with D&D uh, &D News around 3.15-ish, uh, warming the table up for uh, Chris Perkins to do another Dice Camera Action episode uh, at 4 p.m. tomorrow. Uh, and then, of course, Maze Arcana uh, is uh, following that up at 6 p.m. tomorrow as well. Uh, so enjoy the night off. Uh, as it were, and uh, we'll be back uh, on this channel tomorrow. All right, guys. You're the best. Bye.